Good, we got the applause out of the way ahead of time. Uh, are there any questions? <laughs> I always want to start with that. You, you knew you were going to be here, and you probably showed up with the one thing you wanted to carry away. Well, does anybody have the one thing they'd like to talk about or address? Burning question you have? Because if you've got it, I'll address it today. If not, you can creep up and say, I have this problem, could you talk to me? So uh, I'll be around so we can, we can handle that. I'm delighted to be here. Delighted that there's so many of you because my life's work has been to create as many positions for PR people as we can uh, across the state and across the country. And we are a bit in a renaissance of creating uh, school communication positions right now, uh, and that's good. Uh, the key then is how do we use them? How do we get them engaged? How do we make them um, part of our leadership team in a very strong way? Um, I do want to thank our harpist. Wasn't that delightful? Yes. Uh, we don't get that very often, uh, unless there's a transitional leadership with the superintendent, usually bringing the harpist, and then they have the funeral process for the, <laughs> the, the previous superintendent. I'm reminded of a story, though, about superintendents. So um, there's this brand new superintendent, right? She's just got the job, and she's in a medium-sized school district, and she's wandering around the school district, kind of greeting people and everything. So she goes to the transportation yard, and she's out there, she's talking to the MOT guys, and then all of a sudden this runaway bus hits her, kills her, wipes her out. So she wakes up, and there she is at the pearly gates. Harp's going, right? So she's there at the pearly gates, and, and uh, St. Peter looks at her and says, well, who are you? And she says, well, I'm a school superintendent. He says, well, we don't get very many of those here, so um, tell me, you know, what would you like to do? Would you like to stay here in, in heaven, or do you want to end up trying to be in hell? And uh, she says, well, what's the difference? Well, I think I'll let you decide. I'll let you spend a day in hell and a day in heaven. You can make the decision to have how you want to spend eternity. So she says, okay. Is it dangerous now? No, not really. So uh, she... Uh, steps into the elevator, goes straight down to hell, right? So she walks out, the door's open, and this place is rocking, it's looking great. Everybody's all dressed up, they're having a great party. Uh, Satan comes over, he's wearing a tuxedo, you know, he's polished up his horns, he's looking really cool. Everybody seems to be having a blast, dancing, singing, eating great food, it's wonderful. So she parties the day away, the night away. She wakes up, she's back at the pearly gates. So St. Peter says, well, how'd you like that? She says, that was a pretty rocking place. I like that. That was, that was kind of cool. She said, well, you want to try to see what heaven's like? She said, okay, I'll try that. Pops the elevator. Off she goes. And she walks out, and it's serene, and the birds are chirping, and the weather's perfect, and there are little swans all over the place, and it's just really calm and nice. Good food, really sedate. Spend the night there wakes up the next morning right back at the pearly gates. So St. Peter says, okay, you got a choice now. You've seen both heaven and hell. Which way do you want to go? You want to spend eternity in heaven or eternity in hell? She says, well, you know, on comparison, everything seemed to be pretty nice in heaven, but boy, hell really seemed cool. I think I'm ready for that. So yeah, I want to go to hell. So she jumps in the elevator, comes out, doors open up, place looks like hell. You know, it's a fire and brimstone, and the devil comes up, and he's all oh, angry and looking bad. People have scabs all over themselves. They're eating garbage. It's just horrible. And so she goes up to, to Satan. She says, I don't understand. Yesterday I was here, and yesterday the place looked terrific, and today it just looks like hell. What happened? And Satan says, well, yesterday we were recruiting you. Today you're on staff. <laughs> So how do I, no, I back up, okay, my back up? No, it takes a minute to be good. Anyway, so do you often feel like maybe you got recruited into something that didn't quite look like it thought it looked like? Yeah. Uh, one of the things we, I, I did a blog once and it was called uh, 20 Reasons Why It's Harder to Run a School District than a, than a Company. And one of the reasons is, is that in a company, management stays the same and the employees all change. But in the public schools, the employees all stay the same and management changes. And so we have revolving door leadership that comes in, and you guys all have to deal with that, right? You have to saddle break brand new people all the time to the culture of the system. And how do they trust you? Because they're rotating into that system so much 
Um, it takes quite a bit of, of effort. Um, I've been doing this now for coming on to 40 years, public policy related to public schools, <clears throat> and I'm having a blast doing it. Um, I'm coming in as the incoming president of the National School PR Association. Let me ask you a question. How many of you belong to Innsbruck? Okay. I'm going to ask you all to join Innsbruck. It's a pretty cheap membership, but you get connected to people all across the country who do what you do. You get access to a lot of information. If you like what's happening with the CalSPR connection through listservs and things like that, there's a whole lot of things that we do at the national level. So I'm going to encourage all of you, and at the lunch I'll pass out the business cards. They were also having a sale on membership. You get it for 100 bucks less because you saw me. So. Um, but that's a pretty good deal. Anyway, I'd like for you to join Ensper because California has a prominent role in that organization. And uh, as Ensper goes, so goes Calsper. So I'm, I'm here and I was thinking about what I was going to say to you and I figured it just landed in my lap. I'm going to give you the Boy Scout Jamboree speech. <laughs> I'm going to give you the one that should have been delivered. And it's fairly simple. And when you talk to any of you been Boy Scouts, Maybe I got one Boy Scout. Well, I'm an Eagle Scout. I'm, I'm the second in three generations of Eagle Scouts in my family. And uh, you don't go to a jamboree and talk about yourself and rip on people and get people to rip up the seats about your opponents and stuff. You talk about three basic things with Boy Scouts. The first thing is the Boy Scout Oath. On my honor, I will do my best. Honor is an important part of it. On my honor, I'll do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the Scout laws. There's actually some laws to obey the scout laws, to help other people at all times, isn't that what we want to do in our society, and to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Now if you get young men to do that, that's a pretty good thing to do. And that cuts across all lines of ethnicity, race, religion, whatever. Those are good ideals, the best of our society. And those laws, simple words. Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. We revere the institutions that we've created in our society. We maintain civility and respect in what we do. Those are the things you want to instill in young men. And the final thing is, the motto of the Boy Scouts, be prepared. And in our line of work, that's our motto, isn't it? Because you don't know what's coming at you, do you? Every day is a roller coaster. You show up, and it's what walks through the door is usually dominates the first part of your day. So I would all encourage you to be good scouts with all of that oath and law, but in particular, be prepared because we need you now more than we need you ever, and what you do matters more than ever before. So let's talk about how do we get you connected from a strategic advising standpoint. Now, you don't have to necessarily strategically advise the Super Nintendo or the school board, <laughs> but you can advise your director. You can advise an assistant superintendent. And the same muscle memory, professional responsibilities, and how you go about it, how do you become a trusted advisor? Because otherwise, you're just doing stuff, and you all have a lot to do to do stuff. The question is whether your footprint and your impact of the stuff you're doing really matters. So I've been doing this as a, since I left AXA. I left AXA back in, in 1996, and I've been doing this as a consultant with school districts. I've worked with 450 of them practically now across the country and the state. And we do all of these kinds of things, uh, reputation management and marketing and awareness and a lot of crisis communication. I'm an expert on sex sex in every form in the public school system, sex between board members, sex between board members and staff, sex between staff members, sex between you know students and kids and, and, and adults. I've even dealt with 4-H. Oh. Uh, yeah, you can think about that a little while. And the problem is, we all deal with this every single year. It's not a question of if, in some cases, you're gonna have these <clears throat> kinds of situations. And in that crucible, that moment of time, people are going to look to you because you have something in your job description that says you are the chief engager, you're the chief communicator, you're going to be that go-to person. They're going to look for an answer. And oftentimes they don't give you enough respect in the day-to-day -day processing of decisions, but when the, you're in the middle of the frying pan, 
that's when they really need you and want you. So, what we're going to cover today. The role of communication and leadership decision making and, uh, and making a case for the importance of what you do. Part of my responsibility as the ends for president is to go around the country and convince superintendents and school boards and business partners and principals that public education absolutely hinges right now at this moment of truth on its capacity to communicate. And you better professionalize that. You better put people in who know what they're doing. We have a clown car going on in the federal government about people that think they know how to communicate, and they don't. They are not presenting whatever their case is. Their ham-handed approach to communication is becoming the issue. Um, if we did this kind of stuff in our school districts, <laughs> we'd be Sean spicer right out of there. So the role of communication is important. The second thing is the essential competencies that people are going to look for if you're going to be a strategic advisor. And let me, let me urge you this, be careful what you wish for. Because when you say, I want to be a strategic advisor, that comes with a whole lot of responsibilities. Because you now become the caretaker and the steward of the soul of your school system. You are now in a position that you are the shepherd of their reputation. You now know the dark, prickly side of things that, that are wrong with your school system, which raise ethical questions for you and challenge you as a communicator. So be careful what you wish for. Uh, it's not just great, yeah, I want to be a strategic advisor because I'll make $25,000 more than I make now. No, it comes with great responsibilities. We're going to talk about your reputation management of yourself. And let me give you this piece of advice. You're in the middle of the summer. What I suggest you do is go to your happy place with your favorite adult beverage and spend a day and create your own strategic communication plan for you. A year from now, how will you measure your success? What are the benchmarks? What are the standards? What are the things you want to do when you grow up? What imprint, impact, effect do you want to have on the system? How do you want to feel about your job? You want to feel better than you feel right now about your job? What are you going to do about it? Are you a victim? Or are you the vindicator? In other words, you need to take yourself on a personal retreat. Now, if you want to take somebody who you like with you, that's great. Um, but don't get distracted. This is about setting up your plan for you. Because if you don't plan it, you're just doing stuff. And you're the pinata that they whack on and hope the goodies fall out. You're the target that they shoot at to see if their aim's any good. But you need to have a plan for you. That's the first piece of advice that I give to you. And the other is, how are you going to communicate out of the frying pan? Um, we don't want you getting fired, but we also don't want you to get burned to death in the frying pan. So, doesn't wish to move. There we go. Okay. So, there we go, it's just a, it's like my TV set at home. <laughs> How do you spend the first hour of your day? What do you do the first hour of your day? It's the first thing you do, yeah. Check all the emails I might have missed overnight and see what new issues have come up. How many else of you do email harvesting? That's what you do. So you immediately go into your, and other people steal your time out of that, don't they? So all of a sudden, your daily agenda is now driven by somebody in their underwear in the middle of the night typing something out to you to tell you what to do. <clears throat> so, how many of you actually look, that's the first thing you do is look at your email? Yeah, we're paper trained to do that. What's another thing you do first thing in the morning? Yeah. Check the news. Check the news. Scan to find out if you're in it. <laughs> I read the obituary. I just want to find out if I'm in it. <laughs> get a certain age, you start reading the obituary because you're losing friends. Right? And after a while, you forget. All right, so you want to check the news. So you want to find out what's happening that's going to affect me, or did I somehow get something that slipped by? Or did I do something really cool and it didn't get covered? That kind of thing. Okay, so check the news, check your email. What else do you do first thing? Check social media and websites. Yeah. Yeah, the alternative media. You go through and you figure out, is there stuff I need to react to that the, the buzz is going on? How do we position ourselves in social media? Manny, what do you do first? Uh, I 
check in with my staff, mm -hmm. with my superintendent, and I can speak with them for seven hours. Right. Any of you who served in the military, what do you do when you, you, you show up on deck or you show up in there, you check in with the boss, you say, I'm on. That's my number, that's I'm my name, and I'm, one. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, basically, I've got the con. I'm ready to go, okay? So that's an important thing. You gotta check in with the boss. And this is part of being a strategic advisor. When I went to work for AXA, uh, many, 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 many years ago, uh, I had a habit, because I ran my own business for 10 years, of going to work at like four or five in the morning. I worked under time instead of overtime, so I would always have dinner with my kids when they were growing up. So I would go to work at, you know, crack dawn. Well, I carried that into access, so I showed up um, my first day on the job, and there was only one other car in the parking lot, and it was the superintendent's. And so I pulled in, and then I walked down, and I walked into his office, scared the crap out of him <laughs> because it was like 6.30 in the morning and he, that was his, his habit to get in there and work. And so I said, I'm here to report to duty. I want to make sure you know I'm in the building. So he knew that I was going to be there for as long as he was going to be there. That's an important message to send. What else do you do first thing in the morning? Yeah. I make a very long list. So this is purgatory. You go through and you, you go, I'll just all of you whip yourself and tear your hair. It's all the stuff I'm not going to do. Right. How many of you make lists? How many ever get anything done on the list? Well, lists are therapeutic to a certain degree. They make you understand how pissed off you are at your job for the most part. All right. So let me ask you this. What do you do the last hour before you go home? On a normal day? Yeah. Do you think about that as much as the first hour when you're on the job? I think what you ought to do, one suggestion to get yourself strategically positioned, is you ought to plan out what you're going to do the first hour of the day, the last hour of the previous day. So when you hit the job, you're hitting work when you're probably the freshest. So if you think, i got to write this really great speech that my boss is going to carry into the Boy Scouts, or I've got to make sure that I'm writing a script for video, or I've got to get that news release done. You're not doing it at 2.30 in the afternoon when you're glazed over. You've already said, what is the most important thing I need to accomplish tomorrow? And I'm gonna do that first when I'm freshest. But you don't do that when you show up because you're gonna get sucked into the addiction of social media or your email system and not do it. So how you spend your time? It's an investment. Make sure you get a return on it. Second thing is, define yourself as a professional. Don't prioritize your work. Work on your priorities. If you do a big old list and you're getting categories and tracking and all that kind of stuff, what you're doing is you're prioritizing somebody else's workload for you. But are you actually saying from your happy place list that you've created, I need to have these big things accomplished over the course of the next 12 months, three months, one month, a week. So if all you do is prioritize that list that you've already created of all the little teeny things that you're doing, you're probably not gonna get to the big ones because they take too much time. My wife taught me this. I married my high school sweetheart, still married to her. Coming up on 45 years of marriage. She said this, not everything worth doing is worth doing today. So understand that if you're going to be triggered to your professional responsibilities by somebody else's email or that big old honking to-do list, that what happens is the value that you put on the things that think they need to be done today pales by comparison to the things that you think you ought to be doing. Otherwise, you are a pinata, and you're just waiting for them to hit you with a stick. Most important rule in public relations bar none, is do a good job. Performance plus recognition. Do a good job and get credit for it. When our systems do a bad job, we are the spin doctors to try to explain it's not as bad as it is. We also have to be the truth tellers that look people in the eye and say, we screwed up. We didn't do this right. And we have to protect ourselves legally and financially and whatever, but we have to be a conscience that's an authentic voice about did you do a good job? Now in your role, 
you do a good job. You do, in some cases, an amazing job on practically nothing. But you don't get any credit for it. Why? Because we're in the background and we're helping people. You need to have a PR plan for yourself. And my good friend Steve Nag was sitting around, he'd been in Garland, Texas School District for a gazillion years, and he was sitting around reading the paper one morning and a bunch of people came through that were part of the administration. They said, all you ever do is read the paper. What a cush job you've got. So instead of getting ticked off at him, what he decided is I'm gonna write down everything I do for a year. And so he and his staff kept a log of every single thing they did. And at the end of the year, he walked in and he laid this tome on the desk of every one of the people in the cabin. He said, you kind of wonder what I do? It's what I do. So he started flipping through it and he realized, I didn't even know that happened. And Steve said, exactly. <laughs> I didn't know that we did that. Did, were you involved in it? Exactly. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that you do before two o'clock when you get to your to-do list that no one knows about. So if you don't produce a report card on yourself, no one else is gonna, because they don't understand you. You are an anomaly in a system full of educators. You are unique. So produce your own measure of success and get the recognition you deserve for it. The essential role of public relations. What do you think the essential role of public relations is? All of the experts in PR say it's to change behavior. You either want to stop things from happening or get things to happen, but you want people to change their outlook, change their behavior. And that borders also into how we use public relations to market, public relations to do crisis management, whatever, but it is about being a change agent. Do you actually see yourself as being a change agent? Or you just do stuff? Don't just do stuff. Are you moving the needle for your organization? And if you can't say at the end of every day, the work I did today moved that needle, then you're not really doing public relations the way it should be done. So communication is the key to everything we do in public education. It unlocks your staff's potential to do their jobs. It gets parental support, helps schools succeed. It's kind of the X factor in all of leadership. And our job is to, in many respects, convert numbers into words. We're a translator. We turn stories out of formulas, out of calculations. So your job is to clarify policy, practice, and vision, and to build people who adhere to that and a buy-in. Uh, if we, you don't communicate effectively as the professional, you can't expect anybody else in your system to communicate, so you have to model it very well. You model the expectations of the system. You get them into a cadence, a muscle memory, a professional style about how they communicate. The simplest thing is this. You should always be asking this question, and every, you guys go to meetings? Do you have meetings? In every meeting you have, your job is to stick your hand up and say, how are we going to communicate about this? Because I guarantee what's going to happen is whoosh, everything's going to come down to your desk after that meeting anyway, and you're going to have to communicate. So engage these jokers who are sitting around that table with a bunch of ideas. I'll give you an example. So I'm sitting, I, I chair the foundation in my, my local school district, Rockland Education Foundation. So they were sitting around and we were trying to have this big dinner that we're going to have, and we want to shut up some of the speakers because they just go on and on and on. Higher, edu higher education people, you know, you give them two minutes and they take ten. So we're trying to not bore the crap out of everybody. So what we did, let's do a video. Well, I have a bunch of people who've never done a video trying to tell us what to do in a video. Now, any of you have produced a video? It's damn hard, isn't it? And you gotta have storyboards, and you gotta know what the theme is, and you gotta take what everybody's saying in an hour and a half worth of footage down to two minutes. But people who don't know what you do are fully entitled to tell you how to do it. <laughs> and I had to calm a few of my business colleagues down to say, okay, you guys wanna throw $40,000 into this video? Oh, no, 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 we can't do that. Well, then shut up, because <laughs> let the pros do it. So here's the deal. I don't know why that happened, but 
It is the X factor. Man, that got distorted. Oh well. Um, so we won't even talk about that. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but um, my slide system through your Chromebook just got destroyed. One of the things I think it's important is that you understand that communication is hydraulic fluid of your system. And when you lay down pipe and you're connecting people up and you've got this fabric going on in your school district, you're trying to send messages out to people through these pipelines and get response back. It's kind of like an ultrasound. Anybody ever had an ultrasound? What's an ultrasound do? It just sends an impulse out to your extremities and it listens for feedback, come back. It tells you how healthy you are. It tells you whether things are working, whether they're not. One of the things we need to do is understand that your role is to, in fact, put communication through the pipelines that connect everybody. So if you take your table of organization, do you have a table of organization in school? You can put it up there and it shows all the lines and who does what. Do you know what those lines are? Those are pipelines. And you play a role in making sure that personnel talks to payroll. You play a role in making sure that Ed Services talks to school secretary. If you're not diagnosing that hydraulic fluid pipeline, you're not in a role of controlling how your whole system is gonna make decisions. We're trying to change a school system. The only thing that's gonna change it is communication. It is the driving force, the hydraulic fluid to let your system work. So when you put a pressure into, into that system and you shoot a message out, you also wait to get the response. So you are managing a pretty solid system of hydraulics. Okay. One of the things that happens is in your job, do you have the word accountability in it? Because if it's not in your job description, then you aren't involved in it. Because that's how they're going to evaluate you. You do all this stuff, and then they bring out your job description when you're evaluation, and they, they're surprised you even have that in your job description. But if you don't have the word accountability, then how do we understand accountability? We divide the word. Account, how do you measure success? And ability, are you doing what you can do to succeed in it, to, to achieve it? It's like other words. Take deadline. It's a deadline. Dead, what you're going to be if you don't get your project done on time. And line, the excuse you use for not having done what you were supposed to. That's a deadline. Or politics, it's by the word poly, meaning many, ticks, many bloodsuckers. Now you understand politics. <laughs> Your job, though, is traditionally seen by people as being an apologist, a cheerleader advocate, or someone who assesses the situation. We need to convert you over to also being an architect and an ambassador that builds alliances and an analyst that comes back with value-added interpretation of what's going on in your system. If you get this question to be asked, how are we going to communicate about this, you're now entrenched in the debate. And people are going to start to expect you to do that, and they'll start to remember to start doing it before you ask. So they'll say, here's the agenda, we've made the decisions, now we've also built in on that agenda the question, how are we going to communicate about it? So they all start thinking about it. So you are the communicator in chief. You have all these hat rack hats that you've got on there. Everything from, how many of you are involved in morale building? That all comes down, we got bad morale, it's your fault. Go out and communicate and everybody will feel better, right? I did a, an audit once, I, I went through and interviewed every group and I asked them, well, how's your morale? And individually, they all said, morale's terrific. And then I said, well, how's morale in the district? And they all said, it sucks, it blows, it's horrible. <laughs> we got terrible morale in the district. So if everybody had good morale, why do we have bad morale? Because of the one loud voice in the room was saying we had bad morale. And then they blame communication. It's because you don't communicate to me. Not as opposed to I don't communicate back to you. So we need to do all these things. We need to be the accountability officer. Account is we're doing a good job and here's how we get credit for it. We're a storyteller, relationship facilitator, morale officer, bridge builder, message manager. Are we all speaking with one clear voice? And we coordinate in a crisis. 
If you're not involved in the centerpiece of your crisis response team, you're probably on the outside. Now, those of you who are working with teams, your team needs to play a central role because when it comes right down to what is crisis response, it's all about communication. And it's all about communication under 60 minutes. If, you're on, if you aren't out there in the middle of that crisis response, coaching, advising, delivering messages, crafting it, it's gonna be picked up by somebody else. So these are all the people, stakeholders you need to connect to, you know that. But do you have that two-way <coughs> hydraulic fluid connection that you're listening? Do you engage in a process of speak, listen, speak? You want to send a message out, listen to hear what they have to say, and then tell them what they said. Tell them what you think of what they said. Close that loop back to them that valued the input they gave to you. Speak, listen, speak. Wow. I'm sorry this is so small. Um, essential strategic competencies you need to have. Number one, you need to prove that you are indispensable to the cabinet. How many of you sit in the cabinet room? Okay. If you're not sitting in the room, you're listening at the doorway. And then you're not getting everything that's being said. You're the person who maintains the vision for the school system that anticipates the future. When you show up to work, are you thinking about March right now? Are you thinking about June, or are you thinking about August 1st? Because <laughs> if your vision's down here, that's like trying to, any of you uh, sail or, or have a boat? Any of you have a boat? I know you fly. Yeah. Well, if you fly by looking at the at here, you're not going to know where you're going. Sure. With a boat, you're going to do this because you're going to be changing. You need to have a point in mind that you're going to drive to. That's maintaining vision. Can you recite the strategic vision of your school district verbatim? When I was with AXA, I was the only guy who could recite their mission statement from memory. Do you live that mission statement, that vision, every single day? Do you make it part of the work that they do? Do you remind them of it naggingly at cabinet meetings? You need to also speak truth to ignorance. Because when you speak truth, and you don't just give opinion, now you're strategic. Anybody can give an opinion. But what you have the obligation, if you want to be a strategic advisor, is you have to back up your opinion with the truth, with facts, with stuff that makes it meaningful for people. It's the kind of thing that when you talk, they will listen because it's not just you're coming up with your idea about something. You have a rationale, you've got the data, You've got facts that build it up. You've got perspective from other people. Some of you have been in your jobs longer than members of your cabinet. That's a trusted thing that ought to be relied on because you provide a long view, a historical view, a context view to understand the IEDs that are out there that these new people will step on if they're not careful. So you have to speak the truth. Right now, the truth is being challenged across our country. Truth, facts, fake news, alternatives. You also have to be the person that is unafraid to confront the elephants in the room and to kill the sacred cows. We just assume that the union president's always gonna be a jerk, so everybody dances around the union president and they control the, di the dial. Or, we know we've got a racial divide, but we're just not gonna talk about it. We throw things towards equity, but we don't really do things towards equity. In other words, courageously, you have to be the person that nudges your organization to confront the really difficult questions. You also need to make sure that you coalesce people. Part of your job is to be a magnet that attracts interests for common ground the safe zone where you can build coalitions, you can build partnerships, collaboration. You get people to want to work with each other. To be a strategic advisor, you can't do that alone. You're not gonna sit like Steve Bannon and Breitbart and whisper in the ear of the president. You're gonna be involved 
in gathering all of those interests in your community together so that they can, in fact, collectively help the school system work. Your superintendents rely on your capacity to have tentacles out into the community that can help pull that together. You need to value um, movement over motion. And there's a distinction. And if you think, if you analyze your day, are you spending your day doing stuff that feels really busy? And you all got together. What was the first thing you said to each other when you got together? Hey, how are you doing? And you said, I'm busy. <laughs> right? Because if you aren't busy, you're a weenie. <laughs> you have got to be busy. In today's society, you may, how are you doing? I'm all caught up. <laughs> you got anything I can do? <laughs> got to be busy. So what we do is we do a lot of stuff that keeps us busy, and we feel really good about it. Oh, God, I'm so tired. I've been so busy. Got to go home and watch Dancing with the Stars. I'm so busy, right? <laughs> That's motion. Movement is you're getting stuff done. You're the person that they see, and they say, you're a busy person. I'm going to give it to you because you can get it done. Busy people get things done, unless you're just doing motion. But if you're doing movement, you're moving the system along. That is what they're looking for. They're looking for people that cut brush for them, that build trails for them, that identify and sweep the ground to make sure they're not landing on landmines that are out there. You also have to make it really count in a crisis, because that is the ultimate high-definition reality TV show that you're going to be in. If you can make it count in a crisis, all of the skill, all the capacity that you have comes to bear in that short moment of truth. When you get to be on the big stage, you better be able to show that you can perform on the big stage. So. Practice all of the things that you would need in your crisis manual so that if somebody says, well, we just had a sexual misconduct arrest, well, here are the things that we ought to say. We just had a plane go down in our backyard. Here are all the things you need to say. We just had to evacuate because we got a you know, big runoff flood that's occurred because of all the fires. Here's the stuff that I would suggest we do. In other words, they're going to suddenly go, what are you going to do? And if you're not there in the big stage with the big light, it moves on, and your moment of truth is gone. You need to constantly be managing reputation, because right now we're in an environment where we're marketing like crazy against a hostile takeover of the public school system. It's being financed, uh, to some extent, both in, in words and money, out of the federal government to push the idea of vouchers, charters, and investment accounts, whatever. And you're, you're going to have to compete. Your role is going to be how to get people to answer this question. Why should I put my kids in your school? And we have to be able to do that. And reputation is all about that. You also have to nurture trust and confidence because we're a business that is about people. And if you're going to nurture confidence, you've got to earn it. Do you trust people automatically? Now you start off in neutral. And then something happens, you either trust them or don't trust them. And trust can be lost pretty fast, can't it? Tiger Woods made a mistake 14 times, but he made a mistake, <laughs> right? <laughs> Suddenly went from number one endorsements in the number one athlete in the world to, you know, Letcher is free. And he lost his back swing in the process. Bill Cosby, Charlie Sheen, winning. Poker, he's fucked his way back. But anyway, Trust and confidence are important. Do you do what you say you're going to do? Can I trust you with confidences, secrets? If I let you inside and you see what's going on in the room, do you get frightened and run away? Or do you stand in that process? And are you the compass, the conscience for your team? When you can play that role that you raise, you, you, you do this. You ask the right questions and you question the right answers. If you can make sure the right questions are being asked in a conversation that's going to have policy implications, but you also challenge the right answers that are being proposed because maybe they're out of step or they don't do it, so let me repeat it. Ask the right questions and question the right answers. So 
for you to be indispensable, you need to make sure that your work is value added to everybody else's because you're kind of the bonding agent that happens with everything. Your ed services, you help them succeed. Business, you help them succeed. Personnel, you help them succeed. Do you add value to what they do? Do you make their jobs easier? Do you make their jobs more understandable to people? Do you make policy that they save them time because people understand that they, they work through the system, navigate it this way? Is your function in communication indispensable and are you personally indispensable? And what we want, the real legacy for all of you, is that if you aren't there, the function still has value in the system. It's not the cult of the personality. Oh, we had a PIO and then she left and we don't have another PIO, so we don't have any P. We don't have any I because we don't have an O. Are you personally indispensable? Now, what is indispensable? It's fundamental, basic, essential, required, or necessary for the successful operation of an entity. If you're indispensable, the thing doesn't work if you're not there. Now, you just imagine, if you, if you weren't there, what would your system do? Would you be missed? That's a key ingredient. If you can convince people that if you're not there, stuff doesn't happen, you now proved that you're an indispensable activity. I guarantee, if we don't have a CBO, nobody gets paid. We don't have a personnel officer, nobody gets hired. We don't have an ed service pers person, we don't have a curriculum and instruction going on. But there's this presumption that communication is an inherent thing that just occurs. It just happens in the system. So, is it essential? You can't do without it. Um, what would happen if you weren't there? And then the final thing is you come to rely on this from indispensability because you've developed an organizational culture of communication. That's really what you want to create. The capacity and culture that people say, we need to communicate. When I do something, I'm gonna figure out how to communicate it. Matthew's gonna talk about this ADA stuff. So people create a document, but they don't bother to worry about how it's gonna fit into your website because they're not thinking about that as they're creating it. The same holds true for communication. If you need to communicate, it's not a band-aid you put onto something. It's a built-in part of the decision that's made. So, how do your communication plans? How many of you have an actual communication plan? Okay, otherwise you're just firing, hoping the target gets moved in front of where your bullets are. Um, your plans and your practices need to impact these four functions. Stakeholder engagement. Do people own their public schools? Organizational effectiveness. Do you help it run more efficiently and effectively with impact? Do you let your leaders be more effective because of what you're doing? And the bottom line for all of this is our, do our kids do better in school? And I'll tell you, the places where kids do better in school communicate better. It's one of the axioms that we need to prove to people over and over and over again. When there's good communication between parents and teachers, education improves. When there's communication between teachers and teachers, it improves. When there's communication between the school board and the teaching force, it improves. When our business partners understand what we're doing and they connect with us, it improves. Our bottom line is students do better. That's the outcome, the ROI, the impact that you need to keep thinking about. If you're in that with these four things, you are indispensable. So, our bottom line in today's environment is results. We used up all the R words we could about 10, 20 years ago. It was reform, re-engineering, restructuring. We just we used the R key down to nothing. Now we're using all the A words. Articulation, you know, achievement, all the rest of those A words are gone. But we're still with one R word. Everybody wants results. We stop bad things from happening, and most people don't know about mm -hmm. it. We also enable good things to succeed. Sometimes other people get credit for it. Mm -hmm. We build communities of support around those things that are happening in our system, and we clarify our message. In an era when everything is horizontally confusing to people, with lots of different competing sources and alt news and everything else, we become a beacon of the truth and we clarify what our system is about within that fog. You are like a fog lamp in your community. So, 
Do you sleep like a baby? Do you sleep like a baby at night? Sleep for an hour? Wake up? Cry for an hour? That's what babies do. Or do you sleep soundly? How many of you are having trouble sleeping? I am. Partly because I'm doing hospice for my 97-year-old mother-in-law. And that old lady whistles in her sleep. So I've got a baby monitor. I'm, I'm just listening to her do everything from snort snoring to, to uh, whistling in her sleep. And occasionally she'll do some you know, Yahoo kind of scream. She's sound asleep. And, you're, ah! you know, and I'm out there jumping down, going down the stairs, practically killing myself to get into a room. She's out cold. So she sleeps like a baby. I don't. But the big question would be this. Insomnia, you can catch it from your boss, can't you? Right. How many of you are working 12 to 16 hour work days? Yeah. Why are you doing that? Because your boss is driving you crazy, right? You're working too many weekends. You know what a weekend is? It's a chance to get caught up. Right? How many of you look at weekend as a chance to get caught up? And vacation is a false promise. Coming here was an exceptional experience, wasn't it? Holidays, yeah, how many of you really take a holiday? Yeah, holiday is like a freebie, right? It's like landing on free, free parking. You get to do more work. And finding your car in the parking lot is pretty easy because you're the last one there, right? So it's pretty easy. So, one of the things to keep in mind is that you are one of only two generalists in the whole system. That makes you unique and gives you a strategic connection to your boss if that's a superintendent. Everybody else are specialists that work in silos. They have well-defined silo of activity. Now, we lay down pipe between them so they communicate in silos, that's part of our job. But your job and the soup's job cuts across everyone's department, which is an interesting responsibility, isn't it? You have to know everything about everything. Because you'll get a phone call from some reporter from the New Yorker or something that wants to have a question about what this. And you suddenly go, I don't know anything about that. So you make a bunch of phone calls. You now become the sort of the meta knowledge of what's going on in your school system, which is really a terrific, powerful position to be in. You need to be a quick study. So does your superintendent. They got to learn stuff real fast to be able to lead it. And you're both isolated. How many of you work in a one-person shop? We call those one-holers, what they are. You got one, you're doing everything, you're doing it all. And the problem with that is very isolated, which is why you need SoCalSpra, you need CalSpra, you need Hensbra, and you need each other. Because it isn't, this is a job way too big for you to think about all by yourself. If you do, you'll go suck your thumb in the corner for a while. <laughs> The other problem is most superintendents really think they're really good communicators, don't they? And most think they can really write well, and they can't. And part of it is something appears, then they actually think that they wrote it that way. But you <laughs> snuck it out of the pile and just made a bunch of red marks on it, got it retyped and stuck it back in the pile. You're the only one in the whole system not trying to get their job. Right? You think about it, everybody else in that system wants their job. So there are a lot of agendas that go with that, but you wouldn't want that job, not in a million years. <laughs> Particularly if you've been on cabinet, never going to take that job. I'm really happy doing what I do. Just pay me a little bit more. But the buck stops with them, and you are the low point for where those dollars come down. So generally, if you're going to be tied up with your superintendent, as he or she goes, you might go. You need to make sure you're bulletproof from that, but you're also connected strongly because you have an affinity for each other's success. Um, but don't make yourself, you know, the right hand of God, and when God falls, you go with him. So, some of the symptoms of uh, losing sleep and insomnia is you feel out of the loop and distance from decisions. I want you to think about this. Do you ask the question, what happened in that meeting? How come I didn't know about it? Who's meeting? Didn't even know they had one. 
Are you seen as that afterthought apologist? They come out of the room and they tell you what you need to do. And you're not strategically in there to help advise them on what ought to be done and how it'll play in Peoria. Do you walk away from meetings where your boss is and you say, gee, I didn't know that. That's a symptom of having a problem. Do you say, I can't put my finger on what's bothering them, but you know something's wrong. It's like, it, any of you have been married for a while? You know the whole, the whole marriage thing where you look at your spouse or your significant other and they say, what's wrong? And you say, nothing's wrong. Yeah, something's wrong. No, nothing's wrong. You've got that look. What look? This one? <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong. You can tell. You can body language read or you can figure out some change of pattern. Something's bugging your boss. And they're not going to want to talk about it. And when they can talk about it with you, that is a vulnerability that you have to preserve. I deal with superintendents all the time, and I'll tell you, some of the stuff they tell me just makes my hair turn away. Because they're dealing with a whole lot of stuff that a lot of people, it would break their spine if they're carrying so much weight. But on the other hand, I also heard some stuff that they screwed up and they shouldn't have. Talk to them about what they ought to do. The behavioral changes you might, might see as well. These are all symptoms that your boss has got a problem. And if you don't know what it is, you're probably not close enough to them. So you need to, need to establish that relationship of trust. So, do you have a seat at the operating table? Are you there? If you're not there when they're making decisions, you're the afterthought person. So you need to make sure you bust your way into that. Now, some of the other people who want the superintendent's job are going to want to keep you out of there. And what you need to do is also convince them that it is their, their interest for you to be there because you're everybody's best friend. You are like the best friend to everybody in that room. Why? Because you're the pipeline that helps them get their job done. If you can convince them that you're their best ally, they will want you in the room because they want, they want to play you. They want to say, well, the communication person thinks we ought to do it my way. Or we're having a fight between these two departments and they like me better than they like this person. So they're going to play you a little bit, but you got to be in that room because you are a unique perspective. And uh, you need to get infected by their leadership by being in close proximity. So catch the flu for a moment. And if you're not in a meeting, debrief quickly. While it's fresh in their minds, you need to kick the door open and say, okay, I know you guys had this little mini cabinet meeting on this thing. Is there anything that I really need to know? Here's what the scuttlebutt is. You know, is this something that's gonna break? How do I help you? I got a big project over here to to clear the deck. In other words, if you don't debrief, you're gonna get a little stinking pile of problem on your desk that you weren't aware of and you need to anticipate. Part of the strategic advising role is that you anticipate things that are gonna happen. By looking at two or three things that might be disconnected that'll all converge at the same time. Let me give you an example. I first joined Access Staff on my very first day. My first day on the job was at the Silverado Country Club. My wife says, this is gonna happen every, every week for you. I said, no, no, they were at a retreat. But, my first thing that came to mind is we were producing a blue ribbon panel on a rec set of recommendations about improving public education. It had the Vice President of Apple Computer, a whole bunch of stuff. We were putting a ton of money in. They were coming out with a report. About the same time, we were trying to pass Prop 98. So I asked the question, if the election and this report are going to occur in the same week, are the reporters going to ask us, now that you got all this new money, is this how you want to spend it? No one had connected this blue ribbon panel report to the fact that we were going for more money. That's what communicators do. We look at things from a parallax view and we say, wow, the nexus of these things is going to occur here. Have we thought this through? That's the, the early warning system you can give for people. So you need to be a compass. You need to point to true north in most cases. It's everything from, you know, ethical behavior. How many of you have actually looked at the ethics 
statements from Innsbruck. How many have gone through your APR? Okay. One of the workshops we had to do is on ethics. I do one called, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? How many of you have been in an ethical dilemma at a certain point? You get people's lives, their reputations, the issue, you know, is going to potentially challenge the ethics of the organization. You're going to be called on to do that. You need to be an ethical advisor as well. Are you productive? You build relationships. You model the communication, decision making, and frankly, expectations from people about how they're going to behave. Now, if you're not doing this well, you also point people in the wrong direction. You don't want to do that. So, I'm going to take you to the woodshed. Here we go. Is this thing connected through the cloud or something? I don't know. It doesn't want to move for me. It must be controlled by AT&T. <laughs> so I'm stuck. Something's not happening. Backing up. All right. So, one more. I talked about not being able to see the horizon. You also have to be a visionary. One of the keys that they're going to look for for you as a communicator is to be a visionary. You need to be able to help remind them of their vision because they get caught up in a lot of other stuff that takes them off track. So, always have that look, look, look out, spyglass ahead that says that's where we needed to be. Are we getting there? Um, are, we, are we working on our priorities? In other words, are we getting carpal tunnel vision? Because we're getting little things, repetitive stress things that are keeping us from seeing the bigger picture. So you need to manage issues. That'll help. Do you know what's going to be happening in your school district three months from now? What happens to your school district in January? Tell me one thing that happens in your school district in January. Hmm? Yeah, okay, so got a big deal. Can't come up with teachers. What's the other thing? Can't come up with money. Governor's budget comes out. Are you all aware of that? That's going to be nothing but a, a, a whole deal about whether or not we got funds. What happens in March? What do we do in March? Layoffs. Layoffs and personnel. We're also ramping up for all the tests, right? Okay. LCAP. You're doing your LCAP stuff. So in other words, if you're thinking about what you're doing tomorrow, but you're not thinking about what you're going to do three months, four months, six months from now, you're not going to help your team reverse calendar their way back to success. Part of a good strategic advisor is to say, this is going to happen to you in three months. Here's how we walk back from that decision or that action or that event so that we're doing it right. So you're a pathfinder to an end by working it backwards. So, if our job is to produce results, we want to stress outcome, not output. Don't measure stuff you did if it doesn't measure what the impact and the effect was. Your job is to measure those outcomes, because you could do stuff, but if you're really involved with them, you're talking about how do we move the needle. Motion, not, or movement, not motion, measurable res results. One of the things we want to make sure of is that we can actually catalog what we did. You know, in the old days, did test scores go up? We were here, this is Bill Honey. I got up 100 pictures of him, like this, <laughs> or this. Good deal was up or down, but it was, something was different. We did, went from here to here. Do you have sustainability? And I would urge you this. We are in an era where we love our toys. We have lots of technological devices that we can do some really cool stuff with. But if you lose sight of the content you're loading into that delivery system, you've lost the message, the heart and soul of what you're doing. You're just doing stuff, but you aren't managing a message. Worry as much about the content of what you're doing as the way you're going to deliver it to people. Because content is key. Well, okay, so have a place in Rome. Um, how many of you saw the, the, 
stage play Hamilton. Anybody? Anybody see Hamilton? Okay, you saw Hamilton. There's a great, uh, I love Hamilton. Hamilton was absolutely stunning. And I thought, that's a bunch of rap music. I'm probably not gonna like this. But let me tell you, it wasn't. It was, it was narration that was put to a tune, and it was fantastic. But they have one song where the guys go in and they're writing the Constitution, and it's called, You Have to Be in the Room. And it was all about Aaron Burr not being in the room while these guys were creating this great document, and he felt excluded. I want you to be singing that song all the time that you've got to be in the room. Because being in the room makes all the difference. It's being there at the beginning. So after every meeting that's held, make sure that you strategize what you're going to say about it. <clears throat> Maintain good message discipline. What are the three or four things that you're going to say? Create talking points and non-talking points. A good strategy says this is what we need to tell them, and another good strategy says we better not tell them that. And don't say it that way. And then just anticipate what all these stakeholders are going to ask you. And put up your FAQs. It's pretty simple. But if you aren't in the room, a lot of stuff happens in the room that you don't know about. So be in the room. Okay, come on. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Probably the strongest message I'm going to be sending out, aside from this one, the strongest message I'm going to be sending out is we tend to operate our school system with a presumption of leadership. We have a superintendent because we have to by law. Number two, we have to have a CBO because we have to have one by law. Even in a little teeny district, the superintendent is a CBO. But they have to be identified. But we also have to have a personnel person. It's either a director or it's an assistant soup or whatever. And we have to have an ed services type. Those are the houses that exist. It's a tripod. I'm telling you, it's more stable if we have a fourth leg and we need that fourth leg, which is the chief communications officer. And they have as legitimate a role as all the other three legs that exist to stabilize your organization. So we need to make sure that you also need to be the one that goes after all of these elephants in the room. Um, and we'll put this thing up so you can actually get these so they're not as wonky as they are right now. Um, I think we're getting a little bit anesthetized right now to um, racial matters. I think we've had the Black Lives Matter issue, which is make our society a little sort of numb, sort of numb to it but it's still there, it didn't go away. We're dealing with it every single day in our classrooms. We're dealing with racism and bullying and intolerance and indifference and we've got this whole thing going on at the federal government level that keeps stirring that pot up for us and they don't understand it's gonna come right back into the neighborhoods and streets and classrooms of every community that we have. Those are big issues, those are big heavy lifting issues for us. And we gotta make sure we don't run away from those. Equity, equality, tolerance, respect, those are all big things. Those are the big things that we're teaching in our schools that aren't in the curriculum. And they need to be taught. And we're the teachers of that. How many of you were teachers? Came to the system as a teacher? How many consider yourself a teacher? Because you are. Every day you teach people about your public school system. So you gotta have a lesson plan. You gotta make sure you test whether they understand it. Do your research before you go in and evaluate whether it works. Same four things that go into being a good teacher. We have to deal with these issues, though. <clears throat> it really is slow in the draw here. It's, and I'm, I'm going to end pretty quick because you're probably tired of listening to me.
Like my computer at home. I was gonna, I was gonna say you're ten minutes by phone from everybody in the world. That was that little dialogue. Come on, guys, let's go. It's the elements going down the slide. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good picture of the elephant, though. The guys is talking the elephant, so still, still good. All right, crucial conversations. Let's go. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Well, unfortunately, this is my script, so. Oh, the PDF, on to that? Yeah, nothing's moving on. So I, I, at this point, I think we'll just pull up the, um, I will take a question. Come up with one thing, yes? Okay. Okay, so I have, it's kind of not personalized. Let's just do, do go through that. We'll just scroll through that. Sure, again. sure. Okay. So I have a superintendent who is extremely tight with a small cabinet that's too small and is very resistant to having anybody, including me, in there. And that's right. been an issue for three years. So how do you overcome that? I don't know if it's fear on his part. sitting around the outside as there are sitting at the table. And while everybody on the outside wants to be at the table, they understand that the value for them is that they're actually in the room. So my advice is, your job is not necessarily in the beginning to participate in the conversation as much as it is to be there as, as the observer or the superintendent of that dialogue. So I try that a little bit. Mostly, though, that's breaking down the relationship with your superintendent. How do you want to use it? Now, when you come up against it and a superintendent says, I'm going to have you write press releases and I'm going to have you write a newsletter and you manage the website a little bit for me, but you're not going to really carry big agendas, then you have to make that conversation much more meaningful and deep about your evaluation, the role, what you're going to play in there, why does he or she not see And that's scary stuff because you're kind of putting yourself out there. Um, I would talk to the other people who are in the room to find out why they believe you're not in the room. And if they're the same way, they're saying, hey, it took me 10 years to get in the room. Why should I let you in? I mean, they, they may have vested interest in there, but they may also be your best allies. The ultimate thing is it's all going to come back to your desk anyway. The question is how efficiently and effectively and fast it gets to your desk before it blows up. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Come on now, you got more questions. Yeah. All right. Now we're just going to move through this. You can, you can see those okay. So I'll just scroll through. Okay. So. One of the things you control, which I never did control, because I actually started this work before the internet was created, um, is you have at your disposal a massive arsenal of tools to communicate with. Make sure that you are using them and deploying them in a virtual community, that you have all of them integrated together. 
Um, and everybody in your system understands how they're integrated and that they can work in, in, in harmony. Um, you don't want to end up having what you do in communication disconnected from the big things that people are working on in the system. Then you're just a publicist and you're grappling to try to cover stories and stuff as opposed to being the driver of the big message that's coming out of the system. That's why maintaining good connection with your boss is, boss, what, what are we going to be doing over the next three weeks that's going to be monumental? Because i got to be communicating about the monumental stuff before I'm communicating about whether we had an egg drop at a certain middle school. Because otherwise you're just doing publicity kinds of chip shot stuff. But you're really driving the agenda. So connect your boss on that. Now, Practicing public relations is practicing and building public relationships. What does our school system run on? It doesn't run on money. It runs on relationships. If you take a school district that has a thousand employees, how many relationships have you got? A thousand times a thousand. A million possible ways for people to come in. This is the word of mouth fabric of your system. If you add a third dimension to it, you suddenly can't have as many as 166 million ways that you connect. So how you manage relationships is absolutely critical. So how do we get through the word of mouth system, this virtual community, which we have electronically, because what happens is people talk about what they see on Facebook outside of Facebook. And in fact, they talk about it more outside of Facebook than the people who are contributing to the Facebook dialogue. They know when things are out there. So the buzz is what you need to be able to communicate to your boss, that you're in touch with that buzz, that isn't just what they see as you know, the two or three crackpots that respond to a Facebook that drive your school board members to crazy mm -hmm. activities. They look at two emails and they go completely nuts and run around the room with their hair on fire. <laughs> now, One of the things is, if you're a change agent, you have to tip the balance of power. And, and I'm, I'm going to skip through all of this because it's not going to portray very well, I don't think. So we'll, we'll just keep going. And I'm going to close up with a bunch more of a dialogue with you. What I really think you want to do is I think you want to create critical mass behind the big initiatives in your school. You do that by doing things differently. Now, this thing in the middle, is three letters. Right now, if I asked you, if I was asking a principal, I don't have any principals. Anybody was a principal here? Anybody ever? Okay. Anybody ever worked at a school site? Okay. If you worked at a school site, then. So, you go home at night, and there's a bunch of stuff that exists, right? All your possessions are there, loved ones are there, you sometimes eat there, you park your vehicles there. What do you call that place? Home. What home? My home. My home, okay. So when you went off to work, you went to a place that had buildings and kids and employees and the rest of that. What did you call that place? My home. Well, your other home. Work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You call that my, my work, my, my work. school. Yeah. Where did your superintendent work? Over the glass house. The district office. Yep. So even in our situation, we disconnect what's going on in the field to what's going on in the district. So the simplest thing that doesn't cost you a dime, doesn't even cost you another letter, is whenever you use the word school district, you don't say the, you say our. Mm -hmm. Our school district. Now we have possessory interest, public interest is aligned with personal interest, and people have ownership over it. It's my school system, our school district. So don't call it the school district anymore because you've now given them an ownership title to it when you, when you call it out. Didn't cost you a dime. Cheapest thing you can do. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip past a couple of things and we'll just go into some dialogue. Um, one of the things that happens is we tend to get in, involved in the cattle stampedes too much and we run around with our hair on fire. 
How many of you are firefighters? <laughs> you put out fires, don't you? Crisis du jour. You're going to get all involved in that. Now, what, are the, what is a fire triangle? Does anybody know what a fire triangle is? What's a fire triangle? It makes fires work. What's a fire triangle? Kind of like air, fuel, and heat. heat. Air, fuel, and heat. So you got to have all three of those things. Now, in our case, what's the fuel? Some stupid decision that we made. <laughs> what's the heat? Some angry critical group that wants to leverage that, that thing. And what's the air? The internet. So what we have to do is we've got to build defensible space by getting all of the stuff away from our, our big issues. And then we need to either deny the air because we control what's going on in the, in the, in the internet, or we isolate the heat and turn it down so the critics aren't quite as strong and they don't galvanize into other people. And then we stop doing stupid things, which is we deny the fuel. Because otherwise, you're going to be fighting fires all the time, and we need to make sure that we're not doing um, the other thing is this, Tom's adage. Have any of you ever sung in a choir? Anybody ever sung in a choir? Anybody? Yeah, sing in a choir. Yeah, did you ever have somebody that couldn't sing their way out of the shower in your choir? Right. I used to be in a rock band. Doesn't look like it, but I was in a rock band in high school, right? So we had a guy that could play a great guitar, but he could not sing his way out of the shower. So we built him a wooden microphone. And he didn't know it because it was glossy and everything else. For about two gigs, he kept singing his brains out, but nobody heard him, which was good. <laughs> um, those are the best gigs we ever had. But the thing is, if you've got a bad soloist, surround them with a bigger choir. Use those key communicator networks. Use the people. This is how you can help, from a strategic standpoint, keep your bosses from going nuts. Because what happens is a couple of crackpots in the community go crazy and your day is filled with putting out that fire. Two emails, a couple of people, that angry you know, person that's carping on you, control everything that you do. The 10% to control 90% of what we do. So what we need to do is get a bigger choir that is prepared to stand up and talk for us. That's where your key communicator networks come in. And you ought to make sure you have one. Dumb dumbs. And the, the headline of that is you can't argue with stupid. How much of your day is spent arguing with stupid? Now I'm dealing with a with a uh, um, a mother-in-law in hospice, and she's gradually losing her marbles. So she's she's reliving 80 years five years worth of stuff. This morning she woke up and she had to go to school, elementary school. She's 97 years old. So what happens is we end up with people that I have to, with her, I have to over and over and over again, take her back and get her back to reality in a conversation that says, do you remember the fireman? Oh yeah, I remember the fireman. But when did the fireman come? Oh, I was laid out on the ground, I'd fallen down. So what did the fireman do? They picked me up. Maybe I'll fall out of bed again. <laughs> she actually said that. Um, so I take her back to the fireman and I work her all the way back. Well, you're 97 years old, you're not going to school, you've got to stay in bed because you fell down, you can't get out of bed. We go through this whole thing over and over and over again. When you deal with stupid out in your community who is not going to change their opinion, we, can, we hit them as hard as we can and we keep talking to them. My advice is, the best revenge is indifference. You cannot argue with stupid. The only thing that will happen is you'll reduce your vocabulary to four letter words and your blood pressure will go up. So at a certain point, stop talking to them. Talk to other people. They cannot, they want, they're bullies who want to control your time. So don't let them do that. We also, as you're much all too familiar with, we've created these silos of self-selected agreements. And in that silo, we only filter out the stuff that we want to pay attention to. We do confirmation bias. All of those kinds of things occur. Understand you're going to compete with that, even inside our own system. The big thing I would advise you on that is don't be, don't be a victim of it yourself. How many of you get feeds on your internet that mutually reinforce everything that you already believe in? Yeah. Why? Because the analytics and the metrics are feeding you the same stuff over and over again. You've got to really work hard to get out of a bias and a slant 
in the information that's coming at you. So work hard at it. So that's basically it. I'm going to put this back up here. The, the key ingredient, I think, in being strategic is that you have to behave in a way that doesn't look about what you're doing, it looks about what you ought to be doing. And if you're just doing your list, then what you're going to end up with is a list of things, but you're not going to end up with a strategically executed plan. What's the most important thing? Who do you trust in your life to advise you? Think about it. Who do you trust in your life to advise you? And what are the things that go with that? Is it because of position or is it because <coughs> they've earned it? Uh, there's someone who adores you and loves you? Or there's someone who will tell you the truth? If you want to be a, an advisor, a strategic advisor in your system, you have to earn trust. And trust is a commodity that needs to be preserved and, and reinvested in over and over and over again. So work to gain trust trust is, I got your back. I'm not here, I, I'm here to tell you bad news, but I'm also here to help you fight the bad news. So I'm not here to just, I'm not going to get your job, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to push you out of the way. I'm here because I signed off. I reported for duty on the battlefield that said I'm in the position of funding workers. So I would, I would encourage you, work on trust first, then convince and sell everybody on the fact that what you do is a part of what they do. They can't exist without you, and they, even if they think they can. It, they will all come back to this conclusion. If you had an audit, for example, they would all say this, well, we just don't communicate. The reason that our curriculum is all screwed up is because we just don't communicate. The reason we're not hiring enough faculty, you know, enough teachers is we're just not communicating our message very well. So it all comes back to you guys being held for accountability over communication. Anyway, part of it is you have to have an IEP for every one of those people in the cabinet, <laughs> which basically says, hold them by the cheeks like a little woman and say, everything I do is for you. So now they are sold on the fact that you are a bonding agent for everything that goes on in the system. Their success is going to happen So you got to sell yourselves, which means you got to know who you are. This comes back to go to your happy place and create your own strategic vision and plan of what you want to have happen over the next 12 months, and then maintain the vision of that. And don't worry about what you're doing, the little things, if you're not worried about those big things you need the most. Because I'm not going to measure you on all the little things. I'm going to think that's just your workload. But I'm going to measure you on whether you move big things for the school system all the time for a long period of time. That's what I'm going to measure. So I'm going to pose for a picture right now. <laughs> <laughs> and now, do you have any more questions? Was that helpful? Yes. Okay. Did I answer the things that you came in here with? Is there still some other burning issue or thing that you want to talk about? To follow up yeah. on your point, This horizontal environment, we've gone from one to many distribution to a many to many distribution system. You need to be your own wire service. So instead of trying to consider them a vehicle, don't get in their Uber. Go ahead and drive your own cabs. Get into your own system where you basically, if you have a great story you want out, figure out how you're going to deliver that as an alternative to them. Make them compete with you. And if you don't scoop yourself, if you've got a great story, don't give it to them unless you really can get something back for it. Because I'll tell you, we are going through an extinction level event on the media. They have no clue how rapidly they're becoming dinosaurs. The problem is, the federal government's now given them a little bit of air, and we're now getting a New York Times suddenly coming back and things like that. But how many of you came out of the news media? And you couldn't get out fast enough, could you? <laughs> Big
Big things were owning you. Had no clue what you were doing locally. Weren't investing. You're writing two, three, four stories a day in many cases. Had a bias that was being jammed down your throat. The media were almost in a, an extinction level event until Trump came in and now there's a resurgence because everybody's trying to figure out what's fake news and what's not. On this, the, the reporters, here's a couple of pieces of advice from reporters. Up to a certain point, help them do their job, but if they behave in a way, you have to saddle break them from that, which means you give it to everybody else. You start talking about it yourself. You don't use them. And if they start to, to, to write terrible stories about you, then you've got to organize in a way that you can get the people that really matter in your community to talk to the publisher and the editor to say, enough's enough. I mean, really heavy-handed ways to get the biggest real estate developers and, and car dealers in town to be on your foundation board and invite the, the publisher in to say, stop screwing around with my school district and I'll pull a few ads from it. I mean, in other words, if you accept the fact that that battlefield is where the battle needs to occur, they've got you. My advice is, start them. Take the air out of that fire by doing your own stuff. Then they have to report on you doing it. You become a primary source that wrote the story yourself. And then flood them with op-eds. You know. And frankly, if you wanted to play a game, you could get a bunch of letters to the editor of people who are willing to jump in and say, well, I just love my school district, and how dare you talk negatively about it? So every time they write a story, they get ripped. Or they get pat on the back. That's paper training. Up your nose when it doesn't work. Give them a dog bone when it does. My advice, though, is screw them. Just go ahead and write your own stuff. Put it out. Have, accept the fact that you're going to be the UPI of you. And if they want to play, fine. You'll, you'll bring them into your tent. But just start behaving as a news source on news. I think that's a powerful way to go because right now we're trying to figure out where the news sources are. And, and keep this in mind, I worked at Columbine High School. What really mattered was the PTA president in the Jefferson County Public Schools more than Katie Kirk. Why? Because Katie Kirk left. And hell hath no fury like an angry PTA president <laughs> who's there over and over and over again in your underwear drawer trying to worry about what you're doing. So my advice is to make sure you communicate from the inside out. Worry about your stakeholders, not whether or not they're reporting on the town over here, the town over there, or the LA Times is covering it. Because at that point, if you've immunized people to what might be appearing in a bad press situation, they're gonna discard the press. How many people, how many read the paper today? Yeah, we're PIO. How many read it in hard copy? Yeah. Well, that tells you how old I am. The only Grammy E moved in with us, my hospice, hospice was two and a half years ago. She only had one condition on moving in, that she got her own copy of the daily newspaper, the Sacramento Bay. Why? Because she reads it religiously. Can't remember anything in it anymore. And she wants to do her own crossword puzzles in Sudoku. That's my stop. So she's paper trained to use paper. Most of us, we're not even reading the paper. What we're doing is skimming along at 140 characters, this top stuff that we're trying to get. So if you're going to play in this environment that's horizontaling out, be the shining star to be your own wire service. That's my strongest advice. What else? You're hungry as hell right now. Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. The final thing I'd like to say is this. My job consistently has been to advocate on behalf of what you do. I'm going to continue to do that nationally, but I'm going to also continue to do that in California. The role that communicators play has never been more important. You are doing great work. You are doing stuff that I couldn't have even thought about doing when I started this. You have more tools. You got more perception. You have a hell of a lot more energy. Do that work. And do it so that everyone in the world can see what you're doing because you're going to earn your way into that strategic advising role. But don't be afraid to prove your way into it. First rule of PR, do a good job. Second rule, keep to the credit. So you're pumped, you're stoked, you're ready to go. I'm reminded of the final story. If 
final story I always end with. It's the night of the realm, so we're all in Game of Thrones, right? So it's the night of the realm. The night decides he's going to go on a crusade with King and King. He gathers a few of his foul knights. Off they go to the east for eight months. Pillage the villages, ravage the countryside, loot, sack, burn. Have a great time. They come back into the kingdom. They walk into the castle. The knight approaches the crown. The king looks down at the knight. His helmet's dented, his sword's broken, his armor's all dirty and tarnished. The king says, my God, man, you look terrible. Where have you been? Crowley, the knight says, sire, I've been off doing battle with your enemies to the east. And the king says, I don't have any enemies to the east. And the knight says, you do now. <laughs> <laughs> Our job is to build lifelong fans for the public schools and to help children who don't have a vote and don't have a voice and require us to speak for them. Because children aren't our future, we are their future by the actions we take and the decisions we make as adults. You play an important role in galvanizing the adults to do the right thing for our children. We'll put this out so that uh, Ryan could get that in everybody's hands. There you go. Thank, Thank you. you. Lovely parting gift. Thank you so much. So that was amazing. Uh, so what we're going to do, so we're going to keep on schedule with our next session. So my session will be in here at 1 o'clock. Uh, Matt's on ABA compliance will be over there at 1 o'clock. The food is ready to go. So what we're going to do, everyone can fit in there, but if we're running a little bit late, just bring your food back in here. If you're going to be in this session, that's fine. Eat here. Uh, try not to spill, I like my job as well. Uh, so that's what we'll do. So food is ready. We're going to let Tom go first. So if you do want to talk to him at lunch, he already has his food and you don't hold him up. So you, sir, are the first to exit to the left. I'm always first. And then we'll, uh, we will follow shortly. So one o'clock back in here for my session. Matt, over there. Feel free to bring the food in here. 